Hey everyone, this is Miss Cast, and I'm going to go over Texas in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. All right, the first thing we're going to talk about are the types of banks that were in Texas during the 1800s and 19, early 1900s. So we have a national bank, the state chartered banks, commercial banks, and private banks, and I'm going to go into more detail about all of those. First, the first type of banks were the national banks set up by the Mexican government. They would issue a handmade banknote, and a banknote was like a piece of paper that said, I promise to pay you a certain amount of money. And Texans would take that note to the bank and get gold and silver in exchange. However, many of those banks ran out of gold and silver. And so this bank, they'd have useless pieces of paper saying, hey, I owe you money, but they, the banks could not pay. So these banks started to fail, and many Texans stopped trusting banks. However, Texans need another bank because banks lend people money to start new businesses. So in 1835, lawmakers created a new bank, and this was the first commercial bank, the Bank of Commerce and Agriculture. And it was created to help fund businesses. So commercial bank provides services and gives loans to businesses. The businesses, as they make money, repay the loans with interest. And so the bank's profit and the business continues to um, do well and make money. So this type of bank is the type that lent money to the leaders of the Texas Revolution and helped funded the Republic of Texas. After the Civil War, state chartered banks were briefly allowed to do business, and around this time, newly created system of nationally chartered banks began to operate in Texas. The first national bank in Texas opened in Galveston in 1865, but by 1900, there were fewer than 15 national banks. So many Texans turned to private banks after these national banks kind of closed down. We still have a Federal Reserve in Texas, and it is in Dallas, in downtown. Many Texans did not trust the banks or bankers. They believed that banks helped the rich become richer and did not help ordinary people. So in 1845, when Texas became a state, we tried to outlaw banks and said there could be no... Um, like banks in Texas, it also barred private firms from making, like giving loans to people. Um, so that was a huge problem. People just did not trust banks. They'd probably put their money like in their, underneath their mattress or hidden in their house instead of giving it to someone else to take care of. So state charter banks didn't come back around until 1905. Private banks became the most common type of bank in Texas in the years after the Civil War, and private banks did most of their business with wealthy cotton farmers. <clears throat> but these banks were unregulated by the state, and so Texans began to demand for a better banking system. So these private banks were so corrupt that some Texans thought banks would be better if they had the state chartered banks back. That would mean that the Texas government regulated the state charter banks and the state charter banks could provide loans for farmers and ranchers and business people. But they definitely needed to be regulated. And so the main goal in the 1890s of the Texas Bankers Association was to change the law against state charter banks. <clears throat> In 1904, Texans voted to change the Constitution to allow state charter banks again, and now Texas could have state and national banks as well as private banks. So this state banking system began under Thomas Love. He was a member of the Texas House of Representatives. In 1907, lawmakers created the Department of Insurance and Banking to supervise the banks, and the number of banks grew to more than 300 after those bans were lifted. So banking is a key part of our uh, Texas economy. Because people are able to take loans, they could buy more cattle, more ranch tools, farming tools and seeds, and buy more land. 
And so they're able to buy more with their loans. And once they sell their goods, they could pay off their loans with interest and people just keep that, like that cycle going. And it just really helped our economy. So our, as we move into the oil boom and talk about oil that's discovered in Texas, um, banks are going to be super helpful with buying land and giving loans to buy the machines and they would receive massive profits, um, especially after that oil boom. So now let's talk about a few more industries in Texas. So one of our um, big industries in Texas was the grist mill. Grist mills take grain and grind it into a flour, which is the main ingredients in bread. The first grist mills in Texas were located on the Spanish missions. Horses, mules, and oxen would power the mills by walking around in circles tied up to machinery to help grind that, grind, that grain. Um, but now they move the mills to creeks and rivers and they would use the water to, um, you can kind of see in this picture behind the text that they'd use the water to power the mills. So these grew in the late 1800s and early 1900s as Texas becomes more urban where people start moving into towns and cities. Another big industry in Texas is our lumber industry. Can you think of what part of the state that would be located in? Do you remember where the Piney Woods in Texas was? And that would be the Gulf Coastal Plains. So in East Texas, we have huge forests and our Texas lumber is going to be in high demand, especially after the Civil War. Um, remember, most of the South, and especially in Georgia, March to the Sea, was destroyed by the Northern Army. And so they need to rebuild. And so our wood is going to be extremely valuable to other states and our own, our own growth in Texas. So in 1916, they realized a lot of the forests are disappearing and loggers are chopping down these trees and they created the National Parks. Teddy Roosevelt helps create that and um, saves a lot of our forests in the United States. Okay, now we're going to talk about some social issues that are happening during this time. In the 1890s, Democrats started to limit African American voting rights. They would use violence and intimidation and fraud to discourage African Americans from voting. So not everybody had a voice during this time. Remember, this was happening during Reconstruction as well, and it continues to happen into the, you know, up until the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. So um, the party leaders are reducing the amount of votes from African Americans, and they try to remove as many African American people from political offices. And by 1902, no African Americans held any significant political office in Texas and very few voted in elections. While this poll tax was aimed at African Americans, it also hurt very poor um, Anglos and rural like farmers. And so they created a series of laws to have a statewide primary si system for selecting candidates. In 1903, this new system established an all white primary for selection of all Democratic candidates across the state. So African-Americans were no longer allowed to even vote in these primaries. The poll tax and this all-white primary um, put a lock on the Democratic Party that lasted for, it was almost 100 years in Texas. And remember, the parties back then are a little different than the parties today. So what they stand for, it's kind of jumbled around a few you know, a few times. So keep that in mind when we're talking about the early 1900s. I know you guys have done a lot of study on the city of Galveston, but I'm going to quickly review that for you um, here. So remember, before the hurricane, Galveston is like the center of life for Texas. There's tons of trade and shipping. It's right on the Gulf of Mexico. And it was built at sea level. So they've never had a major hurricane. They ne never worried about big storms. And as you know, this hurricane came without any warning. So citizens were 
unprepared and tons of devastation ha- occurs in Galveston. The storm hit on September 8th into the Category 4 with winds up to 135 miles per hour. Um, there is somewhere between six to 12,000 deaths. That we just don't know the true death count um, during this hurricane. So Galveston rebuilt, but it was never the leading port that it once was. There were also some changes that Galveston put in place after um, the hurricane. The city of Galveston raised the city and built a seawall, so they were better prepared for the next hurricane. As a part of the rebuilding, Galveston established a new plan for governing the city. The governor of Texas appointed commissioners to run the city, and each of them are responsible for a major city function, like public works or finance. So many other cities in Texas are going to develop this new form of government. In some cases, the commissioners elect a mayor elect a mayor to run meetings and take parts. Other times, um, they just have the city commissioners that run the city. Okay, now we're going to switch gears and talk about the oil boom in Texas. Spanish explorer Luis de Moscoso found oil in Texas in 1543. He was stranded on the, the shore with his men, and they saw the oil floating on the surface of the water. They were able to patch their leaking boats with this sticky slime. The Spanish did not know it, but they had stumbled upon a substance that would help shape the history of Texas. It would take a few centuries, but oil would eventually have a tremendous political, social, and economic impact. People have used oil since the ancient times, even before the Spanish explorers in 1543. Native Americans on the coast of Texas would use this natural tar to waterproof their baskets and pottery. Sailors would use pitch and tar made of oil to seal their boats in their walls. Oils would grease machinery, axles, and wheels, and it prevented animal products, such as leather, from drying out. After the Civil War, Lynn T. Barrett and his partners formed the Melrose Petroleum Oil Company. Their efforts led to first producing oil well in Texas. The well, located in Oil Springs, east of Nacogdoches, produced about 10 barrels of oil a day. And at the time, the market price for oil was very low, so they were unable to really develop this field. So why didn't people have a big need for oil during this time? In 1897, Ransom Olds produced the first Oldsmobile. So before that, they didn't need a whole lot of oil. It was only used for a small amount of things. But the car is going to completely change the way the oil field is seen. The oil and auto industries help each other to grow. This demand for cars increases the demand for gasoline. So in turn, a cheap and ample supply of fuel increases demand for cars. The oil industry grows to meet the surging demand. Pipelines transport oil from the fields to refineries. Workers refine the petroleum into gasoline and kerosene, and after the refining, the oil flows to the distribution centers. In the 1890s, the Corsicana oil field in Navarro County produced large quantities of oil. Although there's little demand for oil at this time, Corsicana field created more interest in drilling for oil. Joseph S. Colahan became Texas, came to Texas to help. Workers laid pipes and built storage tanks and refineries. And by the end of the decade, Corsicana Fields produced more than 60,000 barrels of oil per year. The rising prices and demand for new gas and powered engines set the stage for something big. And in 1901, that is going to happen and it's going to change Texas economies forever. Patillo Higgins ran a brick-making business in Beaumont during the 1880s. He developed an interest in the use of oil and gas to power factories. He bought the land on Spindle Top Hill, south of Beaumont, convinced that oil and gas were underneath that salt dome. His early efforts to drill wells failed, and he was sure he was going to strike oil, even named, they nicknamed him the prophet of Spindle Top. At that time, Higgins hired Anthony F. Lucas to help develop the land. 
Lucas also failed at first, and he arranged for more financing. The new bank backers insisted that Higgins not be part of the deal. They brought in two other men, Al and Kurt Hamill, brothers that had helped develop the Corsicana oil field. So Patillo Higgins, even though he purchased the land, he is cut out of the deal completely. New drilling started in Spindletop in October of 1900. For months, the crew drilled into the ground, yet there's no sign of oil. Many believed they had drilled a dry well. Then, on January 10, 1901, Spindletop Hill began to shake. Workers heard a rumble, and mud bumbled up from the hole. An explosion of oil shot up for more than 100 feet high. The Lucas Gusher shot out some 100,000 barrels of oil a day, more oil than the other oil wells in the United States combined. The 1901 discovery of the oil at Spindletop ranks as one of the most significant dates in Texas history. News of this gusher spreads quickly. Oil workers, financiers, and onlookers come from all over to see the gusher. By the fall, the oil flowed from six wells at Spindletop. Within two years, Spindletop had produced 17 million barrels of oil. As the number of wells grows, the production declines, and by 1904, the production fell to less than 4 million barrels. In that time, it fell even more. So the main takeaway from this is that the, once you discover oil, it's going, the production is going to increase. It levels off, and then it starts to decline as the wells begin to run dry. The oil boom had a dramatic effect on Texas economy and Texas as a whole. In 1914, the Houston Ship Channel opened. It connected Houston to the Gulf of Mexico, and now ships can sail directly from the local markets in Houston to foreign markets overseas. More refineries opened as the developers found more ways to transport Texas oil to marketplace. The Houston Ship Channel also provide a boon for Texas cotton exports. Thus, Houston boomed as an exporter of both cotton and oil, in the early part of the 20th century. Not only is oil good for the Houston Ship Channel, but it's also good for railroad businesses because oil needs to be transported from the oil fields from on trains to the ship channel. How do you think the oil boom in Texas transformed the population? Well, Texas transforms from a more rural to an urban state. So remember, rural is country, you know, far away neighbors, there's nobody nearby, and urban is a city like where we live today in Coppell, Irving, Dallas. That's the urban area. So oil is such a great source of wealth that people are going to start building more industries and moving into the cities. So cities grow up around these refining facilities like Houston, um, and then they're able to ship their oil off into other parts of the world. So Texas is going to move from rural to an urban state. So one in five Texans now live in the city. How did the automobile industry affect the Texas oil industry? They help each other grow. So the demand for cars increases the demand for gasoline. So the more gas you have, the more demand for automobiles. So they grow together to meet the surging demand. So what about the women during this time? Texas women were most likely to be teachers. So I've got some pictures of your three lovely teachers. Um, in Texas, during the late 1800s, women could not vote, but they could be elected as a public official. So it's a little funky during this time for women, but most of them were teachers if they did not have a family. Once they had a family, they would be taking care of their children and helping on the farm and stuff. So what about the farmers? Well, in the late 1800s, there was an agrarian reform movement where farmers asked for regulation of these big businesses. The farmers felt like their livelihood was hurt by all this oil. So many Texans are growing rich, um, but most people did not. So the farmers were hurt the most by the economy. The cost of farming is increasing, and the farmers had to grow more crops to make enough money. 
But the problem with more farm products on the market is the prices um, drop for those products. So many farmers fall into debt and they kind of blame all their problems on the powerful business people. And on top of all that, there's some big droughts that are going to cause the land to be very dry. So it's just a difficult time for farmers. The last thing we're going to talk about is Lawrence Sol Ross. So he kind of his life illustrates the changes in Texas during the 60 years that he lived. He was a very famous Texas Texan because he was a ranger and a Confederate general. He led the Texas Cavalry Brigade. He was known for his honesty and diplomacy. He helped write the new constitution. He would serve from governor as governor from 1887 to 1891, and Texas prospered during his term in office. When he left the governorship, he was a successful president of A&M, Texas A&M, and he made many contributions as a Texas leader. So there's Sol Ross State University in Alpine. It was named in his honor. In the new constitution that Ross helped write, it limited the government's power. It reduced the term of the governor to two years. It limited the power of the governor to appoint officials, return law enforcement to local control, and the legislature was would only meet every once or meet once every two years. The 1876 state constitution also limited the governance spending power. So he was a very successful governor in Texas. So that's it for Age of Oil. So a few things I want you to remember. Farming, ranching, and other industries are going to grow rapidly after the Civil War because of the new railroads and population boom. The Democratic Party gains control of Texas during this time. And they set up a segregated state. The geographic factors impact Texas in the early 1900s. And a hurricane devastates Galveston, while an oil gusher at Spindletop establishes an enormous profitable industry. And lastly, the emergence of modern times bring reform movements, World War I, and a steadily increasing population to Texas.